And Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering here tonight and what you've already done in our hearts to warm our spirits to the reality of this life of faith and to remind us our solid, of our solid foundation, to remind us of our utter dependency upon you. Now we look to you to teach us, to help us understand what your word has for us, that, Father, we might continue to move forward spiritually, that we might mature, that we might fellowship together around our head, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we might be an appropriate bride uh, for our bridegroom, that we might be pure, that we might be blameless, that we might be the people that you have saved us to be. Help us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're continuing Ephesians chapter number four tonight. Ephesians four, and we've entitled this section, Learning Christ. Learning Christ. We have been thinking about the church and the life of the church. We began in Acts two and learned that they were devoted to certain things. And we see that affirmed in other New Testament epistles. And in Ephesians chapter 4, not only are believers, the church of Jesus Christ, devoted to certain things, but they walk in a certain way. They're devoted to certain things, Acts chapter 2, but they walk in a certain way, Ephesians chapter 4. That life within, that spiritual life that God has granted is evidenced by day-to-day -day conformity to Jesus Christ. The life that has been given to us, the life of Christ, is restoring that image bearing in us so that we are reflecting his likeness, so that we are reflecting his glory. And so the chapter begins with this admonition from Paul in verse number one. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy. Let your day to day pattern of life reflect your high calling is what Paul is saying. Let your day-to-day -day pattern of life reflect your high calling. The things that he's talked about for three chapters. He's now saying the imperative for us is that you walk in a way that reflects that high calling on your life. Let your life together as the church. This is written to a church. Let your life together bear witness to who he is. So that includes sanctification. And that includes witness. In fact, our witness is only as strong as our worthy walk. If we're not walking worthy, we have a depreciated witness. We have l very little to say to a pagan culture if we look like them, if we think like them, if we are motivated like they are, if we live like the culture that we are we are living in, then we are not the new humanity uh, that Christ has created, that God has created in Christ. We're not that new society that Paul has talked about for three chapters. We're not citizens of another country that Paul constant, uh, consistently refers to. And we get down to verse number 17, and what's happening here, from my understanding, is Paul is taking that foundational challenge to walk worthy, and he's going to expand upon that as he completes the book. As the book continues forward, he's going to expand on that. So we might think of it this way. The worthy walk is the umbrella truth here. Walk worthy of your calling. And then in, down in verse number 17, we have the first of those uh, sub emphasis that really support that emphasis. And that is walk not as other Gentiles walk. The worthy walk is a walk that's not as other Gentiles walk. Verse number 17, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. And he expands on that a little bit in that very verse in the vanity of their mind. We go on to verse number 18, and he expands further on how other Gentiles walk. He's really just talking about unbelieving people. They have their understanding darkened, verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness 
And then he says in verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. Ye have not so learned Christ. Learning Christ tonight, first of all, I would like to emphasize what I believe Paul is emphasizing, and that is spiritual choices. Spiritual choices must be made. Spiritual choices must be made, verses 17 to 19. Calling uh, the newborn believer to action. The apostle here is instructing the body of Christ how to live worthy. The individual believer and the local body are guided to the place of decision. He said, you have a decision to make. I've told you what Christ has done for you. I told you that God has given you everything that there is to give to you in the person of Jesus Christ. I think if we could just wrestle with that for a bit, it would have a great spiritual food for us. Everything that God has to give to us, he gave to us in Christ. And so many professing believers are looking for something else. Uh, what an offense that must be to God. He gave us his son. He gave us everything that we need in his son. Spiritual choices must be made. First of all, initially and continually. Initially and continually. Now, this is not automatic. Paul constantly is bringing imperatives before us. Uh, this is something we could potentially overlook. It's something we could forget about. It's, it's not one way, like the Gentiles walk. It's another way. <laughs> Like those who are believers walk. It's not like unbelievers walk, but like believers walk. It's not in the mainstream of where humanity at large is going. It's actually counter current. It's swimming upstream. It's not one way. It's the other way. It's not in the mainstream, but it really is against the current. It's not with the world, but it's countering. It's countering the world. So initially and continually, but secondly, principally, and practically, principally and practically. Folks, we have a new master. We have a new master. We have a new king. We have a new ruler. The rule of Christ in the life of the disciple calls for him or her not to walk as other Gentiles walk. We have a new motive. We now are lovers of God. We now have the life of God in us. We now have others as our passion. We're to love God and we're to love others. The way we speak, the way we think, the way we choose, the habits of life are to be shaped by the admonition here not to walk as other Gentiles walk. So spiritual choices must be made initially and continually. That has to do with Christian growth and maturity. And principally and practically, we're different people making different decisions. <laughs> we are. We're a different people making different decisions. We're a distinct people making distinct choices. We, we're still in the culture, but we're not of the culture. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And there is an emphasis here that Paul has for us. And the way he starts defining that is the last phrase of verse 17. After he says, walk not as other Gentiles walk, he now is going to give us an understanding of what he means by that in the vanity of their mind. Now, we went through uh, Ecclesiastes in Sunday school, and we were reminded that vanity has to do with that which is futile. It's, it's vain for you to do that, right? It's futile for you to do that. If we went out after the service and you saw me with a basketball and I said to you, I'm going to dunk the basketball. You would say, I've watched you hobble around. It's vain, right? It's vain for you, Pastor, to, unless you got something to jump off of. And I wouldn't recommend that because you got to land. But that would be vain. It'd be futile. Let's all gather outside and watch Pastor dunk a basketball. And, and you say, let's get in the car and go home. Why? Because it's futile. It's not going to happen. It's also vaporous. It's, it's short-lived. That's what vanity is. It's short-lived. And so he says, not in the vanity of their, they, they live in the vanity of their mind. That's futile or empty, right? Empty thinking. There's absolutely no substance to this. But folks, this is who we were before. Before, we were just taking life as it came at us. Not anymore. We're distinctively different people. How the world without Christ thinks, that's vanity of the mind. It's empty, isn't it? It's dark. It really is hopeless. Now, you see it every day. It's superficial. <laughs> it's superficial. It doesn't make sense. It's passing. 
It's without substance and without sense. So in the vanity of their mind. He continues in verse 18, having the understanding darkened, a sin darkened understanding. No doubt you in the workplace have to deal with this. You have to deal with the jokes and the language and the attitudes and the, the inefficiency, whatever you're looking at. You're going, okay, that's what it looks like. It's a sin darkened understanding. It's, it's, they're alienated from God. They don't have any reason to live any different. They don't understand. They don't have direction. They don't, need, they don't have any reason to live differently than they're living. living. And Paul is saying, don't you live like that. You, you live differently than that. You have a reason for living. You're not alienated from God. You're not ignorant of God. You're not ignorant of God's ways. So don't live like you are. So the worthy walk, and walking not as other Gentiles walk, have to deal with, has to do with not living with this sin darkened understanding a blindness of heart folks that's the sphere in which unbelievers live now sometimes i think it's very helpful for us just to stop we're in the midst of something like this and to just make some practical application in thinking about the people you're working with and the people you're witnessing to if you if you did not know christ you would be living with a sin darkened understanding you would be doing what they're doing. And, and Paul, Paul reminds us often about that. Such were you. What I think that does is that that calms the, the aggravation and it increases the pity. When we look across there, we're listening to Paul say, not as other Gentiles walk. And, and our first motions may be, you shouldn't live like that. And then you stop and recognize, well, actually... That's how sin darkened people live. And that's how you and I would live, but or for the grace of God. That's why every one of his books continues to pour out the truth about the grace of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ in those first chapters. And it orients our souls and it helps us to understand that when we come to something like this, we're not only to take it to heart in regards to you are not to live that way, but that is the sphere in which unbelieving people live. So you really can believe they do the things they're doing. Why? Because all they're going to get is in this life. That's the way they're thinking. There's no reason for them to have any substance to their life. All they have is the beginning and end of life from their thinking. They have no concept of pleasing God. Why would they do that? Could I turn that a little different way? They have no capacity to please God. Don't you pity that? Don't you find great blessing when God... <coughs> speaks to your soul words of comfort that you know what that that pleased the lord do you realize sin darkened people never experience that they have no capacity to please god they, they they're in living in the vanity of their mind they operate in a sphere of unbelief they have no concept of pleasing god or finding any true satisfaction in god they're truthless thus without guidance they're unable to see they're calloused of heart they're dull of thinking this picture is a moral blindness similar to that in Romans chapter 1, a spiritual insensitivity. So verse number 18 begins with having the understanding darkened. And then it goes on and Paul's defining this out for us because obviously this is what the Holy Spirit has for us. They're not only walking in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, but they're being, they're alienated. They're being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Alienated from the life of God, simply living in ignorance because of the blindness. Uh, the idea of blindness there carries with it the idea of a, of a callousness. Uh, they don't see. And so what do they do? Being past feeling, they give themselves over unto all sorts of expressions of their passions. Lasciviousness, that's Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. That's, that's what they're doing. They're living for that. And they give their energies there. Don't live that way. Don't think that way. They're blind of heart. And the idea of working all uncleanness with greediness has to do with all of that is sensual and everything that comes with that. So spiritual choices must be made initially and continually, principally and practically. There's to be no empty, thoughtless 
or we want theirs thoughtless. There's to be no empty, thoughtless direction in our lives. We really should ask the question, why would I do that? Or why am I doing that? Why would I do that? Or why am I doing that? But secondly, no sin-darkened, blinded influences. Don't be influenced by those that are unbelieving. No sin-darkened, blinded influences in our lives. Spiritual choices must be made. But you haven't learned Christ that way, he says in verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be, he's not really raising the question as to whether or not this is true. He's just stating it in such a way as to hammer home to them what actually has happened to them. If so be that you have heard him, you have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, verses 20 and 21. So secondly tonight, not only must spiritual choices be made, but a Christ, a Christ saturation must be maintained. A Christ saturation must be maintained. The, the image that Paul uses here is being in school, being discipled. And he basically says Christ himself is the subject matter. And we're learning Christ. You have not so learned Christ. Christ himself is the subject matter. But he also indicates in verse number 21, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him. Paul also says that Christ himself is the teacher. I think it's a fascinating thing to think about because who actually taught the Ephesians for three years? Paul did. <laughs> But Paul says Christ taught them. Christ is the model. He's the subject matter. But Christ is also the teacher. As Paul is teaching, the subject matter is Christ. And, of course, the, the spirit of Christ is teaching. You have heard him, he says. You have heard him through the voice of the apostles. You've been taught by him. The idea there is you've learned in the sphere of him. You've learned in the sphere of him. So he's the subject matter. He's the teacher. He's the environment in which you're learning. And then he says, and it's interesting in thing, that he turns now from speaking Christ to use the human name of, of Jesus as the truth is in Jesus. So why does he do that? Because he's about to launch into a whole paragraph about how we're supposed to live. How we're supposed to live as Christians as humans living in this culture, the truth is in Jesus. That's the human name, that second Adam, that perfect God-honoring humanity that is our model. So a Christ saturation must be maintained. So he puts in contrast to, in the vanity of the mind, sin-darkened understanding, he puts that in contrast to, you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, he himself is the curriculum. So we could say it this way, the subject matter is Christ. The subject matter is Jesus Christ. A Christ saturation must be maintained. The subject matter is Jesus Christ. So in, in just a moment when he launches into what this life looks like, this worthy life looks like, what should be happening is Jesus Christ should be standing up right beside those descriptions. If you and I say, well, what does that look like? What does it look like to put this off and to put this on? Jesus Christ is standing up in front of us. The person of Christ is put before us because he is the subject matter and he is the teacher. The subject matter is Jesus Christ. Secondly, the teacher is the spirit of Christ. The teacher, and we know this, we know that Jesus promised this in those last hours with his disciples. And John, I'm leaving you, but I'm not leaving you without a comforter, without a teacher. I'll send the Holy Spirit. He will teach you. This whole arena of discipleship is placed before Christ's church. And we change from glory to glory as we are exposed more and more to the Lord Jesus Christ. So to put this together, we'd say a new perspective 
what Paul is talking about here, not as other Gentiles. Well, he's talking about a complete, a new perspective in all of life. So what of life has changed for those who have come to Christ? Every bit of it. What part of my life is touched by my relationship with Christ? Every bit of it. Every nuance of it. Every individual part, every relational part, the way that I think, my attitudes, the way that I speak, the way that I act. A new perspective had come to all of life. I've learned Christ. I am learning Christ. Well, secondly, a fresh awareness. There is a fresh awareness of the realities of life. Who we are. Talk to the Lord about this. Talk to the Lord about who you are. Talk to him about why you're here. One of the things Paul does again in each of those letters is he just lays out before whoever he's writing to. We read in, in 1 Corinthians 1 in our prayer time tonight. He, he just puts it out there. He said, oh, the grace of God in your life. Look what God has done for you, Corinthians. All sorts of things that he's going to have to talk to them about. But he starts out by saying, would you stop and take note of God's grace in your life through Christ? What has God done? He's chosen out of people. He's made a church of God. He's chosen out of people for himself. What has Jesus Christ done? He sanctified you. He set you apart for himself. God has chosen out a church for himself. Christ has sanctified a church or a bride for himself. A fresh awareness of the realities of life. What Christ has done for us and what that means. So how then does this transformation take place, we might ask. If I'm in the school of Jesus Christ, he's the teacher, he's the subject matter, he's the environment in which I'm learning. What does this look like practically? How does Christ purify his bride to reflect himself as our bridegroom? Now I want to stop again to remind you of something that we've talked about several times recently. And that is, these are not admonitions that God is calling us to muster up the energy in and of ourselves to accomplish. He, he's, he's helping us understand what Christ is accomplishing in us. And so anytime he says, now you get involved in Colossians, he says, you have put off the old man and you have put on the new man. He does it in Colossians in terms of salvation. When you trusted Christ, you put off the old man positionally and put on the new man. That was the starting place. But here in Ephesians, he, he talks of it in terms of action. We are to be taking off like a jacket. You're to be taking off the old man and you're to be putting on the new man. But if we get this mixed up in our minds, we find ourselves gritting our teeth and determining that we're going to work this out. No, God is working this out. If you'll remember in Psalm 119, 11 times the psalmist says, Lord, you quicken me. He's got all sorts of passions about the word of God and desires to live out God's word and all sorts of uh, uh, speaking in terms of what other people are thinking about him while he seeks to do this. But he never loses sight of the fact that it's the Lord that has to quicken him. It's the Lord that does this in our lives. You say, why such an emphasis? Because I think we lose sight of the fact that our part, folks, is what we sang about tonight. It's faith. It's surrender. It's participation. It's readiness. It's inviting the Lord to have his way. Well, all of our invitation songs sound like that, don't they? Just as I am, have thine own way, Lord. All to Jesus, I what? Surrender. Why is that? Because we can't do any of this. And even with the seed of God in our lives, we have to live in yieldedness to God and his spirit and his word. God will work this out. Now, having said that, I want to look at this paragraph briefly tonight. And I think it's probably something that we need to give some more attention to at a later date. But let's put down this third part of learning Christ. Spiritual choices must be made. A Christ saturation must be maintained. Thirdly, a radical transformation must be ministered. A radical transformation must be ministered. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The idea here is a stripping away of the old, a discarding of the old man, but also fresh clothing. 
in garments of practical holiness and edification. Folks, this should be taking place from the day we trust Christ to the day we leave this planet. It should be growth and maturity. Be more and more like Christ. There should be a glory to glory. There is, Paul talks about a mortification. But again, I think mortification in very clear terms is, is dying to self. It's surrender. It's yieldedness. It's, it's our will being submitted. So we have before us, first of all, a striking, recognizable, and I'm using this word beautification because I really think that is the appropriate word. There's a striking, recognizable beautification. All the old, the corrupt, that which is in the process of degenerating, that which is ruinous, that which destroys us is being put off. And the new that is freshly created after the likeness of God is being put on. Our old man as Gentiles was dominated by lust and uncontrolled passions. But that new man is created in righteousness and holiness. Let's watch it, please, in verse number 22. That ye put off or take off concerning the former conversation the manner of living, behavior of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust or desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You are being renewed in the spirit of your mind when you're yielding in faith to the Lord. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's pleasing to God. It's what righteousness means, pleasing to God. And it's separated unto God. That's what holiness, true holiness means. There's a striking, recognizable beautification. Well, secondly, there's an obvious, total incompatibility. I think you'll get that in just a moment. Radical transformation must be ministered. There's a striking, recognizable beautification. This is what God's doing in his bride. There's an obvious total incompatibility. You say, what do you mean? Well, watch as the following verses move forward. Because he's about to say, now this is incompatible with being a Christian. This is what you to be as a Christian. Watch it in verse 25. Wherefore, put in a way... Lying. Lying is incompatible with Christianity. What's the put on? Speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Take off the rags of lying and put on the beauty of telling the truth. There it is. This is what is happening. This is transformation. Okay, where does he go next? Verse number 26, be angry. Anger is a passion that God gives us, but it can be a sinful passion. Be angry and sin not. Put off that kind of anger. Put on, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Address, address whatever is awry. Because otherwise, verse number 27, you're going to give place to the devil. You're going to give the devil an opportunity. Incompatible with Christianity is this uncontrolled anger, this sinful anger. God's way of dealing with that is let not the sun go down on that and don't give place to the devil. Don't give inroads to the devil. Don't give an opportunity to the devil by harboring that anger. Next, verse number 28, incompatible with Christianity is stealing, taking something that doesn't belong to you. Let him that stole steal no more. Not putting in the work that you're getting paid to put in. A variety of ways in which we steal. Let him that stole steal no more. What's the put on? What's the, what's the beautification? Rather let him labor. This is what we were created for. This is what we're redeemed for. Working with his hands, the thing that is good. That he may have to give to him that needeth. Not only make provision for yourself, but be so faithful and productive that you're able to help other people. Verse 29, something else that's incompatible with Christianity. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Then you know what? 
Corrupt communication is never to proceed out of your mouth. This one gets real close to home, doesn't it? What is corrupt communication? Corrupt is something that tears down. So communication that tears other people down. Paul is saying, let not corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's incompatible with your Christianity. But here's the put on. Here's what God replaces that with. Here's how God beautifies our lives. We speak that which is good to the use of edifying. Instead of tearing people down with our words, our sarcasm, our unkindness, our criticism, we are to use words to build people up that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And in a summary format, I think he's picking up the line of what he's been talking about from verse 24 and following. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Because that's what happens when you have all of this Gentile behavior going on in your life. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed into the day of redemption. In appalling way, he circles right back to theology and says, you know what? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and don't forget, you grieve the Holy Spirit when you live like other Gentiles live. And then he puts a summary together on that and says, here, let's just put it all together. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. And evil speaking be put away with all malice. Malice is ill will, ill will toward other people. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Why? Because it's incompatible with your Christianity. That's not who Christians are. Here's the put on. Be kind. Be kind one to another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. That's countering the wrath and the bitterness and the anger and the clamor, isn't it? Forgiving one another. Where's the model? Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. A radical transformation must be ministered. A striking, recognizable beautification. This is a glorious thing that God is doing in our lives as we submit to him, as we grow and mature in him, as we sit in his classroom He's the teacher. He's the subject matter. He's the environment in which we learn this. An obvious total incompatibility between how other Gentiles walk and how the body of Christ is to walk. So no area of life, no area of life untouched. I think we get that sense. I'm, I'm not sensing that Paul couldn't say anything more. He couldn't delineate more pieces and parts of life. I think he's made his point. Don't leave any area of life untouched. No area of life untouched. And then secondly, and here's the goal, no old life patterns remaining. No old life patterns remaining. Under the control of God's Holy Spirit, a complete restoration. A complete restoration within it produces true image bearing. This is how a true disciple learns Christ. This is how a true disciple is being taught by Christ. This is how a true disciple lives in the sphere of Christ. Learning Christ, spiritual choices must be made. He's brought us to the point of decision. A Christ saturation must be maintained. And a radical transformation must be ministered. This is the saving work of God in our lives. This is New Testament Christianity. If we claim to be a Christian, this is what life looks like for us. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray uh, that your word would take root in the souls of these folks that have heard it this evening. I pray against the enemy who would snatch the seed, who would work in people's minds to reason around this truth, to excuse Gentile attitudes and Gentile speech, Gentile behavior. I 
pray, Father, against the enemy who would twist this into some moral high standard that we are expected in and of ourselves to grow to, to achieve. I pray that you would give us a greater understanding of what it means to have the seed of God in our souls, as John teaches, to be people of the new birth, to be people who have the spirit of Christ living in us, witnessing to us, teaching us, giving us opportunity to yield and be changed and be transformed. And I pray that we'll be reminded tonight of the forgiveness that we've received from you and how even now in the quietness of this moment, we can confess our sins and you will be faithful and just to forgive our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I pray that this might be our heart, that this might be our prayer. I pray that we will not allow the word to bounce off and thus be hardened instead of softened by your truth. We praise you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.